Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala wa ba'd So we continue and return to our study of this book Hayatuna al Suriya, Our family life between the reality and that which is hoped for um, In the last sitting In the last sitting we began discussing some of the rights of the children And how the rights of the children and the shaykh he divides them into the rights that take place before the birth of the child and then the rights that take place after the birth of the child. As it relates to some of the rights that we already covered, they were the rights that took place before the birth of the child. From them, uh, there is the issue of husun uh, ikhtiyar, a zawj, the excellence or being good in your seeking of a spouse, meaning that you seek uh, a suitable person to have those children with. Um, likewise, there is the issue of uh, you know, making the du'a before intimacy. Making the du'a before intimacy, this is from the rights of the children. Uh, and it will be a means of protection for that child if Allah Ta'ala decrees a pregnancy from that act of intimacy. And then there is uh, caregiving, uh, taking care during pregnancy. Taking care during pregnancy. Meaning that, you, meaning that while the woman is pregnant, you are seeing after the needs of that child and doing everything that will contribute to the well-being of that janine or that child that is inside of the womb of its mother. And uh, by way of example, we have the story of Maryam and her mother, when her mother was pregnant with her and how she, while she was pregnant with Maryam, she uh, made a vow and she uh, made a vow for that which is inside of her womb to be in the service of the masjid. That the child that is inside of, the, of her womb would be in the service of the masjid. And she ended up giving birth to a female child, and we know the female is not like the male. Uh, so still, Maryam, she was in the service of Allah Tabarak wa ta'ala, serving the house of Allah Azza wa uh, So they showed that the parent, they have concern for the well-being of their child, even while they're still inside of the womb. Um, so we're going to pick up today, bi ta'ala, from the rights of the children after the wilada, after birth. And so we're going to mention a number of them. He mentions quite a few, but we're, we're going to uh, take a couple of them in the sitting, inshallah ta'ala, so we get the people home before it gets too late. Al-Haqq al the first right, the first right after birth, after the birth of the child, is tahnik al-walid. It's called tahnik al-walid. And at tahnik, we spoke about this when we did the series of lessons regarding uh, rulings connected to the newborn. The tahnik is when the child is born and the father or the mother, um, while, you know, hours after or soon after the birth, uh, minutes even, you take some dates, right? You take some dates, chew them, and you take a portion of that chewed date, put it inside the mouth of the child, right? It's called a tahnik. Um, from the benefits of this, as Ibn Qayyim he mentioned in his book uh, Ahkam al Wadu, or uh, the Ahkam that are connected to the Mawlud, um, Tuhf al Wadu bi Ahkam al Mawlud is the name of the book. Um, he mentions here from the benefits of that is that it accustoms the child to taking nourishment from outside of the womb. Because inside the womb of its mother, the child is getting its nourishment through the umbilical cord, right? This is how the child is getting its nourishment. So now, once the child comes out, it's not used to taking food in through its mouth, right? And taking uh, nourishment by way of its mouth. And so, this accustoms the child to doing so. Um, and so, he mentions here that that this is done with a date. Uh, Ibn Uqayim likewise mentions, and, he's, and the Sheikh he quotes here from al Nawawi, that in reality, any sweet thing, anything that is sweet in taste, perhaps you'll use honey or something like this, anything that is sweet to, ta to taste, uh, uh, tahnik can be performed with that. He says, Li thubuti hadhi sunnah, and this is due to this sunnah being affirmed from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kama jaa min hadith asma, radhi Allahu anha, annaha lama, lama waladat Abdullah ibn Zubair, uh, on the authority of asma, that when her son Abdullah ibn Zubair, and asma, who, who is this asma? Who is she to the Messenger of Allah, Sister-in-law. So this is Aisha's sister. Aisha's sister. 
Okay, so she gave birth to Abdullah ibn Zubair, right, who was the son of Zubair, one of the ten that was promised paradise. She came to the Messenger of Allah alayhi wasalam, with him. For and she placed Abdullah in the bosom of the Messenger of Allah alayhi wasalam, for Hanakahu bi Tamratin. And so he performed the tahniq with a date. He, he performed the tahniq with a date. Thumma da'a lahu wa barraka alayh. And then he made dua for him. Wa barraka alayh. And he, yani, he, barraka alayh. The, he mentions concerning the baraka here uh, that this is something which is specific to the Prophet alayhi wasallam. Normally we perform tahniq. It's not... We're not, we don't think that by way of letting the saliva of the parent mix with the saliva of the child that we are bestowing or we are contributing to blessings by way of that. But this was the intent behind going to the Messenger of Allah and doing this. But that was specific to him. He's the Messenger of Allah. We perform the tahneet because it is a sunnah. It is a sunnah of our beloved Prophet and it has the benefits, the likes of what we mentioned earlier. So he mentions here barraka wa barraka barraka alay yani that he sought blessings by way of that uh, this is due to the saliva of the messenger of Allah alayhi wasalam, mixing with the saliva of the baby He says and so the two parents should be diligent in not letting this sunnah pass them you have a child be sure that you implement this sunnah now in the, uh, yani in the first moments after the birth of that child so you're going to take something that is sweet. Take something that is sweet. كما ذكر الحافظ النبوي رحمة الله عليه فقال تفق الألماء على استحباب تحنيك المولود And now he said that the scholars, they are in agreement regarding the fact that the tahniq of the child, it is something recommended. إنه ولا نتيه بتمرن When the child is born. Meaning that you do so with a date. فانت عذرا فما في معناه but if you don't have a date, then whatever is similar to it, and it was and it is it is similar to it in terms of sweetness. Anything that is similar to it in terms of sweetness. Now he says for Yamda and Muhannik, so the uh, one performing the tahniq, he's going to chew the date and soften and moisten it until uh, it becomes palatable. Now and it will become easy for the child to swallow. Then he opens the mouth of that child, placing it inside of his mouth in order that uh, something from that can reach the throat. And by Allah, I've seen you know, how this works. I recall when, when Musa was born, um, and initially he would not nurse. Initially he would not accept them, he would not take the milk until the tahniq was done, until the, you know, the sweetness was placed inside of his mouth. And when he tasted the sweetness inside of his mouth, he began sucking on my finger. Right, so he could taste the sweetness inside of his mouth, and it's prepared him to be able to, uh, to actually uh, consume milk. Now he says, "How the technique is it specific to the Prophet or is it permissible for other parents besides him?" As sawab, the what is correct is that it is permissible uh, for all parents. As, as Sheikh Ibn Baz he mentions, "You still have a technique." He says that it is recommended, it's Klam Sheikh Bibaz, it is recommended to perform the tahniq by way of a date by the father or the mother uh, placing uh, the chew date, a portion of the chew date inside of his mouth. Nam. And then, uh, and then uh, you are going to place it from there into the mouth of the child. So that's the first right. The second right that he mentions is Halq al-Shar al-Mawlud al-Dhakar fil yawm al-Sabir. He mentions the shaving of the head of the male child on the seventh day. Shaving the head of the male child on the seventh day. Uh, the, the scholars differ regarding whether or not it can be done to the female child. What is correct is that it can be done to the female child as well. It is the sunnah for the female child as well. It's not as emphasized as it is with the male child. It's not as emphasized as it is with the male child, but uh, it is permissible. As some of the Sahaba, they would shave the heads of their daughters as well. Okay? Uh, and that one gives uh, the weight of that hair 
in silver away in charity. It's going to be a small amount, a very small amount. If you were to give, for example, $10 in sadaqah after shaving the head of your child, you will have overshot. You will have done more than enough, far more than enough. It's a very small amount, right? Think about how much hair actually weighs, especially a baby's hair, right? كَمَا جَاءَ فِي حَدِيثِ عَلِي As is coming in the hadith of Ali that he said أَقَى رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ عَنِ الْحَسَنِ بِشَاتٍ That the Messenger of Allah alayhi wa sallatu wasalam He gave or he did the aqiqa uh, for Hassan with a sheep وَقَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمُ يَا فَاتِمَا إِحْلِقِي رَأْسَهُ And he said, oh Fatima, shave his head and give its weight away in silver and charity Hadith is reported by Tirmidhi and other than him from the Hadith of Ali and Al-Albani graded as Sahih. He says that, Ali, he said, فَوَزَنْتُهُ So I weighed his hair. And its weight was the price, or its weight was, it uh, ended up costing a dirham or a portion of a dirham. So this is from the Sunan that are to be performed. It is from the rights of the child. It is from the rights of the child it is, dil uh, it is uh, befitting to be diligent upon that. The third right, and we'll suffice with this one, as the speech is somewhat lengthy regarding this third right. The third right of the child after birth. It's choosing a good name for the child. You choose a good name for the child. So you, you can name the child. So here's the thing, all right? Uh, as for the naming of the child, when should the naming be done? So you have one statement amongst the scholars is that the naming is to be done on the seventh day. On the seventh day, right? And one is that the naming is to be done on the day that the child is born, right? And there's proof for both. There are proof for both, okay? Uh, and we know, alhamdulillah, some of the brothers, one of our brothers, rather, he, every time he has a, has a child, he lets the child walk around a few days, well, not walk around, but live a few days without a name until he watches the child and watches his personality and how the child is. Okay, now I'm going to name you. And he names the child like this, right? So the child is just, just living nameless for a minute. Now, so naming the child, okay, as it relates to it, it's being done on the, on the first day of birth, we have the hadith. The dimension of Allah, alayhi wa sallam, that... Uh, he said, That a child was born for me tonight for some maituhu bismi abi Ibrahim. And so I named him by way of the name of my father, Ibrahim. I Meaning he named him after he was born. He named him after he was born. He says, Or you can name the child on the seventh day, Kemadalla alayhi hadith al Hassan and Samura, radiallahu anhu fi dhikr al aqiqa. As has come in the hadith of Hassan. On the authority of Samara, when he mentioned the Aqiqa, he says, Kul gulamin murtahanun bi aqiqatihi tuthbah anhu yawm sabi'ihi wa yusamma. He said that every child is held up. Every child is held up. They're in a state of limbo, waiting for the Aqiqa to be, to be performed. And so, it is to be slaughtered for him on the seventh day, and he is to be named. It is, you, know, you are to slaughter for him on the seventh day And he is to be named As it relates to the Aqiqa And we're going to get to that In, uh, in, in some of the upcoming classes inshallah ta'ala The slaughtering of the animal uh, One sheep for the female child Two for the male child That uh, This is a sunnah To be performed On the seventh day After birth all right? So the day that he's born You count seven days out from that day you count seven days out from that day, on the seventh day, the aqiqa is performed. You slaughter the animal. And if you can't do it on the seventh day for whatever reason, you do it on the fourteenth day. If you can't do it on the fourteenth day for whatever reason, then on the twenty-first day. And if you can't do it on that day, then any day that you can do it after that. Any day that you can do it after that. Okay? At any rate, what we get from this narration is the affair of naming the child on the seventh day. He says, anhu yawm that he is to be slaughtered for on the seventh day, while you and he is to be named 
as well, meaning on the seventh day. He said, so you should choose for that child, Isman, Tayyiban, Hassanan, Yud'a, Wuyunada Bihi. That you should choose for that child a goodly name, a beautiful name that he is to be called and summoned by. وَقَدْ رَوَى بِنُ الْمُبَارِكْ عَنْ سُفْيَانِ الثَّوْرِ رَحْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ كَانَ يَقُولُ حَقُّ الْوَالِدْ عَلَى الْوَالِدْ أَنْ يُحْسَنْ اسْمُهُ إِذَا سَمَّاهُ وَأَنْ يُحْسَنْ أَدَبَهُ He said that the right of the child upon his father is that he is to choose a good name for him when he names him and that he is to discipline him and, and he rear him and educate him in the best way. He said the reason for that, he's going to mention some very nice speech here. The reason for this, right, the reason for us taking uh, great pains to try to choose a goodly name for the child is that the name that you give the child will have an effect on his nature. I mean, the, 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 way, that, the way that you name that child is going to have an effect on that person's character, on that child's character and his nature. He says... Naam, and it's going to have a, an effect on the forming of his personality. How the Amr al is something which is known. And he says, and what? And the scholars of the legislation as well, uh, they affirm this matter. Due to this, uh, a sayer said, meaning someone said, he says that, and rare is it that your eyes will see a name given to someone except that it's made, it's the meaning of that name will be apparent in that person's character. Meaning whatever that name means, the meaning behind that name, you're going to see it in that person's character. He says, so you will see the effect of the name which the two parents choose for that child in the tasarrufat wa af'al wa af'alihim meaning the way that the child conducts himself, the way that the child interacts with others, you're going to see the effects of that name upon that child. وَلِذَلِكَ كَانَ الْبَعْضِ مَنْ مَنْ رَزَقَهُ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَ الْفِرَاسَ He said, due to this, some of those whom Allah Ta'ala had granted firasa. We remember we spoke about firasa. What's firasa? What is firasa? Okay, it's that penetrating type of insight that Allah Ta'ala gives uh, whoever, whoever He wills amongst His servants. He said, so some of the people who Allah gave Firasa to, they would be able to guess a person's name. They would be able to guess a person's name just by seeing how he acted. All right, by seeing how the person acted. Kama huwa ma'ruf an Iyas ibn Muawiyah, as is known from Iyas ibn Muawiyah, who was from the judges that were well known for his Firasa and his insight that he had. That if ever he looked at and reflected upon the tasarrufat of a shaks, a person that he didn't know, a person he didn't know, he would watch that person, how that person dealt, how he acted, how he interacted with others, his speech pattern, and so on and so forth. And he would look at these things and he would say that a person like this should be named such and such. And he would almost always be right. That would actually be that person's name. It would actually be that person's name. Nah, he says that Ibn Qayyim he spoke about istinbat al asma min khilaf tabai' al shakhs the issue of names having a connection to the nature of the person himself and he said that Abu al Fath ibn Jinni rahmatullah alayhi he said wal qad marra bi dahr wa ana asma al ism he says that a time passed upon me where I would hear a person's name. Right? I Meaning some people they come, they may be foreigners, right? And they have a name. You hear the name, but you don't know what the name means. He says, I wouldn't know the meaning of that name. So I would take the meaning of that name from its wording. And then he says, meaning that I would look at that person. I will look at the person who had the name. I will look at the person who had the name. And I would, he said that I would, based upon what the letters mean in the actual, 
you know, derivative, what the word is derived from, that his name is, right? What the word is derived from. He said that I would look at the person's character and line it up with that and say this, this must mean such and such. It must mean such and such based upon how that person acts and interacts. He says, And I would be 100% on point or close to it. I'll be on point or close to it. He says, and Ibn Uqayyim, he said that, I mentioned this to Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, and he said, وَأَنَا يَاقِعْ لِي ذَلِكَ كَثِيرًا He said, that the same thing happens to me a lot. Ibn Taymiyyah said, the same thing happens to me a lot. Meaning that he would look at a person, he would, he would look at their name, he may not even know what the name meant. Right? But based upon the letters that are in that word, and how the person acts, the name must mean such and such. Because this person is like that. Ibn Taymiyyah, he said, this would happen to him much. All this goes to show what? That the name, it has an effect upon the person. The name you give that child has an effect upon the person. And due to this, the Prophet, alayhi salam, he often would change some names once he heard them due to the meanings that were in those names that were not good. He says, as has come within Abu Dawood in his Sunan, that he said, وَغَيُّرَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ وسلم, اسم العاص. He changed the name of Al As. Al As, yani the, 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 where it's derived from, Al Asi, yani one who was disobedient. He changed the name of Al As. He changed the name of someone who was named Aziz. He changed the name Atala. He ch someone came being named Shaitan. He changed his name. Some, someone came being named Al Hakam. Allah is Al Hakam. So he changed that person's name. Gurab, Hubab, Shihab. Changed uh, Shihab's name to Hisham. Was Samma Harban Silman. Someone came being named Harb, meaning war. So he changed his name to Silm, meaning peace and ease. Right? And other than that, he mentions a whole host of names which the Messenger of Allah changed, alayhi wasalam. Not just people, places. Yani, there was a, a pathway. There was a pathway known as Shiab al Dolala. Shiab al Dolala. So he changed the name of that pathway to Shib al Huda. Now, a tribe, Banu Zinya, he changed that name to Banu Rishda. And other than that, he says, He likewise clarified the names that were beloved to Allah. Wa ta <laughs> he says, and this, no doubt, it contains inside of it an encouragement towards utilizing these names. Why? Because they're beloved to Allah Ta'ala. Now, he says, and this is due to their beauty and the suitable nature or the uh, uh, excellence of their meanings. And he mentions uh, four narrations which contain examples of this. First of them is the statement of the Messenger of Allah alayhi wa sallam Ahabu al-asma'i ilallah subhanahu wa ta'ala Abdullah wa Abdul Rahman The most beloved of names to Allah are Abdullah and Abdul Rahman Second hadith Ahabu al-asma'i ilallah subhanahu wa ta'ala Abdullah wa Abdul Rahman wal harith The most beloved of names to Allah Abdullah Abdul Rahman and al harith al harith Third narration, his naming of his son Ibrahim. Wulida li al-layla gulamu sammaytuhu Ibrahim. A son was born for me tonight, I named him Ibrahim. Name of a prophet, one of the best of prophets, one of the messengers of strong will. Likewise, he said, alayhi wa sallam, lama su'ila an ism li mawludin anda ahadihim. When he was asked about yani, someone who had a child, and he was asked about a name. To suggest a name, he said, Samuhu bi habbil asma ilay, Hamzata bin Abdul Muttalib. He said, Name him with the name of one of the most beloved people to me, meaning Hamza Abdul Muttalib. Name him Hamza. All, right? All of these they contain an encouragement towards taking the likes of these righteous and beautiful names names of the prophets, names of the Sahaba, names that they know Ta'beed, Allah. Now, the ulama, they mentioned that we, when we get from the narration, the most beloved names to Allah, Abdullah Abdul Rahman, is not just those to any name that denotes servitude to Allah. Abdul Razak, 
عبد العزيز عبد الحي عبد الفتاح and so on and so forth any name that denotes servitude and slavery to Allah is an excellent name to give your child now he says and so now we mention some affairs and we conclude with these uh, these, these couple of points right uh, these are some guidelines to utilize when trying to choose a good name for your child and trying to avoid those names that are repugnant. Firstly, the first guideline, to some be asma'al anbiya, naming with the names of the prophets, utilizing the names of the prophets. Who are amrun jaiz? He said it's an affair that is permissible. And some of the scholars have mentioned there's ijma consensus upon that. Likewise, being diligent to name your child with the names of the righteous people. Uh, like the ulama, for example. Name your child with the names of the ulama. Muqbil, Rabir, and so on and so forth. Muhammad, Naam, and so on and so forth. They are from the salihin. Secondly, the second point, and udu an al asma lati hawlaha ishkal, staying away from problematic names, staying away from problematic names, such as names that denote a taabi li Allah, such as names that denote servitude to other than Allah, like a person being named Abdul Rasul, or slave of the messenger, or Abdul Nabi, slave of the prophet, or Abdul Hussein, and other than this, from the names. Which the servitude in that is specific to other than him, Tabarak wa Ta'ala. The next point is Tinabla Samala Tifiha no Min Qubh. Staying away from names that have something from uh, evil or repugnance to them. Or they contain something in them that would be uh, a type of belittlement. For that child, in reality, he says, or staying away from the names that are gariba, shadha, they are like strange names. It's so when the people look for these unique types of names that nobody has. They have no asal whatsoever, no foundation, no basis for uh, uh, whatsoever. fil They have no meaning when you look. You look at it in reality. There's no meaning in the language. So it is not befitting for the two Muslim parents to uh, burden themselves with searching for names that have no origin. Nor do the Arabs know them. The Arabs have never even heard of these names. Neither in the times of the pre-Islamic days of ignorance nor after Islam. Or they have no correct meanings nor are the meanings uh, considered to be uh, or, or, or nor are the names or the meanings of these names mustaqima fi al Arab and they are not good names in the language of the Arabs. He said without doubt a person and they burdening themselves trying to search high and low looking in these name books and going everywhere they can possibly go, trying to find a name that your child is going to be the only one with this name. He said, this, way, this, this path is a tariqah غير sadida. It is not a straight path. It is not an upright or correct path. Nor is it suitable or beneficial for your children. The next point, اجتناب بعض الأساليب الخاطئة في انتقاء الأسماء It's staying away from some of the erroneous methods of searching for a name for your child or deriving, extracting names for your child. He says, as occurs a lot with the A'ajim, a lot with the non-Arab. A lot with the non-Arab, you find them, he says, Allah Ta'ala may give them a, child, a son or a daughter. Yafta safhatim min al-Qur'an. So what do they do? They go to the Qur'an, open up a random page in the Qur'an, and they're going to take a word from that page which they find and name their child with that name. He said, and from the examples of that that have reached me, it's which the Sheikh he mentions is kind of funny, but it's kind of sad. <laughs> he says that, that one of the fathers, when a child or son was born for him, 
بحث في القرآن وانتقى لف. So he searched in the Quran and he came across the uh, 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 the statement in the Quran. Min al khasirin, min al khasirin. And so he named him his son Min al khasirin. Who knows what this means? Min al khasirin. Amongst the losers. Amongst the losers. So his son's name was Min al khasirin. He says that, and he didn't know the meaning. He was unaware of the meaning. He just, you know, sounded good to him, I guess. Name my son, Min al khasirin. I know a brother, his name was Khashiyain. Khashiyain, that was his, his name. Right? Allah was time. So he says that he didn't know the meaning. وَإِذَا بِهِ يَرَى أَنْ هَذَا الْإِسَمُ أَوْ ثُمَّ كَبَرَ الْوَلَدْ Then the, the, the son it grew up. The son grew up. And he realized that that name, it had the indication of khasara, of him being a loser. It had the indication of him being a loser. And so he went and added to the front of his name, Laysa. He added Laysa. <laughs> he added Laysa to the front of his name. So now his name is Laysa bin al Khasirin. I mean, I'm not for the losers. This is his name now Laysa bin al Khasirin ibn Fulan. He said, Have a, it's all this type of takalluf and a person burgeoning himself to try to come up with these new and, and unique names. There's no need for that. It's blameworthy. He says that. وَلِمَا نَسْتَعِيذْ عَنْ أَسْمَائِنَا وَأَسْمَائِنَا He says so. Why would we turn away from any of the names that we are accustomed to, the good old fashioned names that we are accustomed to? Muhammad, Abdul Rahman, Ali, Abu Bakr, Uthman, so on and so forth. These old fashioned names that we're used to, we're not looking for anything new. We're pleased with that. These names, especially the names of the Salihin, the righteous people at the head of them, the Sahaba, the ulama, the prophets, messengers, and in the names of the best of the people, it gives the child something to aspire to. It gives the child something to aspire to. Now, give them a, give them a name with an excellent meaning, or name after one of the, one of the righteous people. He says that, Now, فَتَسْمِيرُتُ الْأَبْنَاءِ بِالْأَسْمَاءِ الْجَيِّدَةِ وَمَا فِيهَا مِنْ مَعَانٍ جَمِيلًا هُوَ مِنْ هُقُوقِهِمْ الْوَاجِبًا so naming the child with goodly names and names that have beautiful meanings to them are from the rights of the child that are obligatory upon the parents to observe. And the names are many by the bounty of Allah Ta'ala. So therefore it is upon them to uh, extract and look for the best of names for their children. We stop here at the third right and going to pick up from the fourth right which is the Aqiqa in the next sitting. هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين